This week's episode is sponsored by Change. Change is an online mentoring program that teaches people with no experience how to create a real profitable online business and e-commerce. I have been working with Ryan at Change for a few years now and attended many events and got to meet the amazing community of like-minded people. These guys are the best of the best. The support these guys offer is personal, no bots or employees, there's no experience needed, but like anything in life, it takes time as it's a real business with real results. For more information, go check out Ryan on Instagram at RyanJB and he will guide you through the steps to help build a successful business. You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you are notified for when my next podcast goes live. Boom, we're on. And today's well, guest, we've got Lee Marvin. How are you, Marvin? Yeah, thank you very much for having me, James. I'm thanks for well coming on, you. brother. Cheers, man. First and foremost, thanks for coming on the show. But we'll promote your new book straight away. Okay, brilliant. Born in prison. Yeah. Mad story. You've been on Lad Bible. You've been yeah. on Sean Atwood a few times as yeah. well. Yeah. Book out. Fair play, mate. I understand yeah. your story. I've watched a few of your interviews thank from you, yeah. Born in Prison, Addicted to Crack, Abused yeah. at 11. Yeah in and out of prison goes on and on yes we'll get into it but yeah. your book where can people buy it um, Amazon it's available on Amazon exclusively from Amazon um, it's doing really well as well and it's a really good read great reviews and that so far um, it's got a good good, quite good good bit of tips in it you know for trying to help you get clean and stuff a few things what you can do to try and use yourself you know if you've got a problem so it's got a good it's doing well very dark life it's no secret no and pain, misery, torment, kind yeah. of tortured soul, would you say? Yeah, I'd say that, yeah. I'd say that, yeah. I've had a, I've had a fight to get to where I am today. I appreciate my, my come up now. Yeah, but now you're here. You're, yeah. you're trying to do the right things. You've got a book out. Yeah. You're sitting next to me, mate. So I am, yeah. fucking clearly <laughs> working. Ticking, I, I, yeah. <laughs> Before we get into all the madness, no, I always like to go back to the start with my guests. Yeah. Try and get a bit of understanding about you, Marvin. Okay. Where you grew up and how it all began. Yeah. Okay, mate. Yeah, so... um. I was born in HMP Style, which is a women's prison up in Wimslow, Cheshire, um, to two drug, true drug addicts. Um, my mum was a drug addict and my dad was a drug addict as well. Um, I later learned in life that my mum, when I got the paperwork, um, it turned out that my dad, um, she never named my dad on the paperwork. So there was a reason to that, but we'll get into that later on. Um, I went in an orphanage, spent time in an orphanage from the prison. Uh, my mum was being told I'd be given to two doctors if she would sign me up for adoption. Um, so she was very torn by that. I mean, and she was quite immature as well because on the same paperwork it states that she was asking them, can she send cards and letters and birthday gifts and would they get there if she sent them, do you know what I mean? So she was quite immature. Um, so yeah, she signed me away finally and I went to an orphanage, what was quite strict. Um, I believe the babies was locked in a room at four o'clock and then not seen till the next day. Um, so that was quite tough knowing that. Then I was chosen by a Jamaican man and a Welsh woman. Um, the Jamaican man was quite strict. That's an understatement. He was kind of I don't know. He was a bit mad, to be honest with you. He, he couldn't. He, he could never be just a nice man. You know what I mean? He used to beat me a lot. I used to wee the bed. He'd beat me more for it. You know, I had this reoccurring dream that I was helping my mum mop the kitchen floor, and it turns out that I wasn't helping. I was wee in the bed. So yeah, I used to wake up with that struggle going on. Um, so that was quite tough. Um, yeah. So my dad was a Jamaican man, and he kind of. Went to town on me a bit growing up, rubbed my face in wee, uh, beat me a lot, 
And I remember going to school and like having accidents in school and having to come home from school with my underwear in my hands and bleeding. Um, he'd go to town on me for that, you know. So uh, let me just wipe my face. Yeah. Yeah, I, my dad used to go to town on me quite a lot for no reason, you know, just daft things, we in the bed there, uh, asking to go out too much, you know. Um, but it wasn't just me he was beating, he was beating one of my, my mum had a friend, a Scotch woman from the Garbles called Janet, and she had other kids. And he was beating one of their girls as well, because I got told later on that the police got involved and he got told that you can't be hitting kids, you know what I mean? So we chilled out a bit then. But I was always running away from home, running away as a kid, you know. I was a, I was a lost little child. I, the first opportunity, I'd run away from home, try and get as far away as possible. I'd end up getting the police. The police would bring me home in a police car and take me back. Um, so my mum told me from very young that I was picked. So I used to think I'm picked. I used to pick berries and stuff and pick things up off the floor and say I'm picked. You know, that's how easy it is to pick something. Like, I was always wondering what happened to my mum and dad do you know what I mean and there was whispers but I can't remember when that I was born in prison but I think that came when I started going to prison myself so um I started stealing from very young I used to just go in the local news agents and take sweetie bars and stuff and the fella in the shop he'd let me get away with it the local news agent and then one day he told me dad and my dad beat me, he went to town on me and um, the fella never told him again, you know, I used to go in and still do it and he never said anything after that. Um, so I started, We there was a lot of petty crime on my estate, you know, people break cars, broke stolen cars and stuff like that. So I was always a bit of one pushing him down the road, trying to get him started or my mates would try and start him on the canal. So the police had always chased me because I was the biggest and I was the tallest for our age. Um, so I was in a bit of my very young a lot, but um, I, it never stopped me doing anything. Um, I got to about eight years of age and I was going in and out of all the empty houses on my estate. And I pushed this door over on an empty house and there was a fella asleep there. And I ran off, went back the next day and um, he'd been glue sniffing. So I started copying what he was doing. And when I got this hit, it gave me this escape from like all my, even very young, even though I didn't know what like stress or anything was, I was too young to understand it. It really gave me a quick release and just gave me this, like a breath of fresh air from all my troubles, gave me this escape, what I needed. Even though it was wrong, I knew obviously glue sniffing and that was a wrong thing to do. It felt like the right thing to do because I wasn't happy in the world just living day to day so i chased the glue sniffers out of the houses in and out of the empty houses and stuff like find watch where they'd go and then i'd go in afterwards and then the gas came on the scene butane gas and i started doing the butane gas so we was in and out of the city center um like i used to petty thief as well go in the shop main shopping centers in the city center and rob cars and whatnot and we used to get caught, like me and this lad who I still see to this day, um, we still talk about it. I was getting caught very young for shoplifting and also was going to the red light area because that was right next to us as well. So we'd watch all the working girls get to work and that lot. So um, it got to, I got to 11 and we moved house and we only moved a mile away. But to me, it felt like another planet because it was over the canal and it wasn't really allowed over the canal. So I met this guy called Andy who lived in the flats opposite where, where I lived, the big four flats what opposite our estate. And um, he was about 16 and I had this games console and he, he said to me he had games for it. So we went to his flat and went to his house and it was his mum's house and we were in his bedroom. I'll never forget it. And he said to me, I ain't got the games for it. My mate's got the games for it over the way. So he took me over to this house and um, it was a man in his fifties and he was, his mum was in the, in the, in the living room, the top of the, as you go in, his mum was like to the left in the living room and his bedroom was right opposite the front door. 
and he just literally grabbed me and before I knew what he was doing, he pulled me in the bedroom and he had this big wooden toolbox, what he had behind the door and he dragged it behind the door and he just started licking me and stuff and was touching me and molested me and raped me anyway. So um, I got raped and I went home in shock. It was like I was hallucinating. I was instantly just like it was, I was tripping again. I felt like I was tripping off the, the go. And um, because I wasn't allowed in the flats, I'd been told, stay out of the flats, stay out of the flats, stay out of the flats. And because it happened in the flats, I thought, I can't tell my mum and dad because I've been in the flats. So I had to keep it a secret. And I kept it a secret. Um, and I went home, I went to school the next day. And it was mad because I just thought everyone knew. I just thought all oh, my mates are going to start saying, ah, oh, you was abused yesterday. I just thought everyone knew. It was mad. You just think everyone's staring at you and everyone knows, like they can read it in your face. Um, so um, I went home and I went home and he was at my mum and dad's house. He'd come round and said to him, oh, thanks, your son for helping my mum the day before. He went shot for my mum. Is it all right if he comes round helping regular, like, so my mum, mum's like, yeah, of course. And I'm like, all right, then I'm just like in shock. Anyway, he'd literally stand on his balcony and call, beckon me to his house, you know what I mean? It was just, a, or he'd come round to the house and say, I'm just taking him out for some deliveries. And that would me going to the like, pits of hell. Um, so I used drugs from very young to, can, to deal with that. Um, um, tipex, I'm sniffing lots of Tipex, thinner in school robbing it out of all the teachers' chairs and nicking the gas and taking glue and plating up and petty theft and wagging school. Um, got to 13 and I was already in town doing street robberies. Taxing had come around, so everyone was taxing everyone else and um, even I got taxed. So all that started happening. I got arrested for robbery at 13, um, got convicted for robbery at 14, um, so then straight away, I remember then when I got arrested, the police officer, he said to me, if you was a bit older, I would kick the shit out of you for what you did. You know, I'd only robbed a cigarette of someone. My mate robbed a signet ring. So then I'm on the police radar then. Um, but by then we're already selling drugs. This woman on my estate said to us, do you want to start serving up for me? So we're selling from her house, from a little spy hole. By the time it's got to 14, I'm kind of avoiding that paedophile, even though he's still there and I know he lives there. I'm just kind of avoiding him and he's coming around and I'm telling him to move. And, and um, I just started thieving and going down the red light area and just pissing around, really. Just just hanging around with all the wayward kids, you know what I mean? And just felt that was where, where I was at home with the people who was troubled. The kids who were runaways and stuff like that. So I was always around the runaways and stuff. And um, I was in and out of the clubs. The club scene had started then. Acid House scene had started. So there was a nightclub on our estate called the Thunderdome. Everyone used to go to it. I was selling trips in there, whizzing there. They had it easy if I could afford it, you know what I mean? Obviously selling Snideys as well if we could, you know. Um, going in the Haciendas, selling bits of pills and whatnot, just trying to make a few quid. So that was that. Party life was ticking over. Everything was good. Um, and then... One day there was this beautiful girl in a club dancing with her and we're talking afterwards and that. And she said, come back to mine, we'll chill out. And I'm just dabbing whiz at the time. It's only like 17. And um, i am never forget it. I'm sat in the living room. She said, have you ever tried cocaine? I went, yeah, 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 no. I tried it in a spliff and that. And that's all I ever did. It's only ching spliffs. That's all you ever heard was around then. And she bought a crack pipe in and that was me then. Straight away, addicted, instantly, loved it. Crack was just better than all the other drugs combined. Um, uh, quickly became a crack addict, robbed everyone around me, stole off everyone, borrowed off everyone. Um, just been, just, you know, as you do for drugs, um, committing petty crimes, city centre, in and out of prison. Well, my first sentence was uh, a robbery times two. Some lads were selling smack on my estate. Um, two kids had come from another state serving up and I knew they was in that house. Someone had told me they was selling. I went, nah, he used to buy weed off me. He's a muppet. I'm going round there now. I walked round down the road, seen some lad. I just shut it down my sleeve, said, yeah, lad, you want to come on a graph with me? He said, yeah, yeah. Took him, knocked on this door. 
walked in, Rob D's drug dealers took the smack, took the money, took the bracelet off him and all that. And on the way out, the lad, but unbeknown to me, had threw the machete in the back garden. So a day later, I get nicked for robbery, times two. And two of the lads had said to him that they'd been robbed in the house. Obviously, they didn't say they were serving up and that. So I got a bail. I'm I'm outside a new um, shopping centre, what, near me, one day, smoking drugs in this house. And I see him going in the shopping centre. So I kick his legs from underneath him. And this episode is sponsored by Fire Away Pizza, the fastest growing pizza company in the UK with over 150 stores. With their fresh quality ingredients and unique pizzas, they will have you coming back for more. Use code JAMES20 for 20% off. That's JAMES20 for 20% off. Put my knee to his throat and I'm like, why you blew me up, you little shit? And anyway, he went straight to the police. I get remanded into custody, and I walk into Hindley Prison, and it was like, uh, it was like nothing I'd ever experienced before. I walked into a bare cell with a bed frame, no toilet, just a yellow piss bucket in the corner, and the windows was broken, um, and it was like these cages on the window and it was like literally millipedes and spiders and insects on there and we had to shit in pieces of paper and fold it up and push out the window um very very tough no exercise fucking you had people sh- screaming 10 cheesy bell ends out the window and all that very very tough environment um so i toughened up very quickly really um but living the life of a crackhead was just horrible Dis- disgusting life I was a, an addict every time I got out of prison I'd commit crimes go back to prison get out do something else go back to prison um, so I was doing that getting coming going back and forth to prison and um, I was hanging around in the, the gang infested area and there was a lot of gun crime around there at the time I mean Gunchester Gunchester yeah they gave it, it, they gave it the name Gunchester and it was the reason because the reason with that was because there was two gun ga- two gun gangs vying for a little small area and it was just a main road separating the two of them not even a main road a small road so literally they were just shootings around a mile radius of them two estates all the time you know what I mean and we used to like try and earn a few quid off him like oh can we get your customers and very rare and some of them be like yeah yeah but sometimes it wouldn't work like that we'd be robbing customers and stuff uh, a couple of times it come on top for me you know what I mean um, been shot before now got shot for fucking supposed to be selling for someone not uh, not selling for them and they ended up shooting me you know what I mean um, all my own fault you know I could have died that day you know what I mean um, a lad said to me do you want to start selling crack for me and I knew he was a gunman. I know he's a gun gunman. But I've gone, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's gone, don't, don't not pay me, so shoot you. Right? And I still took him and smoked him and kind of avoided him for a couple of days. But I seen him. And then and he went, like, Marvel, where's the money, man? I said, bro, I smoked him, you know what I mean? I'm gonna be honest with you. And he went, nah, you took the piss, I told you, man. I've shoot it if you so he gave me some more to sell for him, but I think he just did that to try and help me out, you know what I mean? And not to lose face and stuff. And I smoked him again so well deservedly, you know what I mean? The guy fucking pulled a big big 357 revolver out at me and shot me, you know what I mean? Where did you get shot? Um, right in my leg. Um, I was outside the club. What had happened was um, my mate, I'm in town, like I kind of avoided him for now. And it's got to the weekend and my mate said to me, Man, I've just got some money here. Um, gonna go and buy catch you want to take us to say who's got the best white so I said yeah I'll get in a taxi with you have you got 80 quid to lend me he's gone nah nah I've only got one six I'll give you 20 quid and I thought shit I can't pay him getting this taxi anyway pirate taxi kind of ducking down in the back but these guys are nosy in it they want to know who's outside the club parts of outside this nightclub and this guy's seeming gone Mav blah blah wants you in there fucking hell he's come out and gone come here I want you and I thought, shit, man, I'm going to get shot here, man. I know it, I know it. I just thought, don't kill me, bro. And then he just gone, come here. Took me around this corner. And he just went, pulled this big fucking long nose revolver out. And just went, 
bang, bang, and the second shot just went boosh straight through my leg. And um, I don't, I'm not sure if it dropped me or not. I can't remember if it dropped me to the floor. But um, I made it to the car anyway, and my mate's back from the car by then, and they're waiting for me, like, and I've gone, oh, I've just been shot, you know, and he's gone, what, you've just been shot? Jumps out of the car like an idiot and starts shouting, yeah, he just shot him, shoot me. And I'm like, yo, get in the fucking car. They are shooters. They will shoot us, you know what I mean? Acting like a fool. I thought, oh my God, the guys are just going to shoot up this car in a minute. Anyway, he's jumped in the car. As he jumps in the car, the pirate taxi drivers pull the key. I say that before. Left the keys in the ignition and just ran off, yeah? Just see his dreads in the air fly, flying like the air. I thought, shit, man, we're in the car. Look, these keys are in the ignition. Gone to me, mate. Get in. Let's go. So he's gone, where are you going, MRI? I've gone, nah, man, let's go to town, smoke a few pipes first. So he's gone, you're mad, you, you know what I mean? You've just been shot. I thought, oh, fuck it. I'll just do like Rambo. I've been watching a few Rambo films, you know, where he gets a ribbon and ties it round it and all that. I just thought it was Rambo, just being a dickhead, basically. Gone in this nightclub toilets, um, started smoking crack and obviously my heart's pumping faster so the blood's coming out of me faster and uh i'm in a woman's toilet and he uh, just there ah, and there's blood everywhere and i look and i see all my handprints all over where i've been messing around and um she goes oh you fucking hell what's going on in here and i've gone i've been shot she's going you can't stay here go to the hospital so my mate, the bouncer, one of the bouncers has got a black bag and put it on his car seat and dropped me off at the MRI and I blagged him for 20 quid on the way. That's how bothered I was about it, you know what I mean? Like a normal sane man would be like, glad to be alive, but all as I was thinking of where am I getting my nice crack from, do you know what I mean? So I get discharged, I discharge myself after, like they re clean it all out and they put like a big Tampax in my leg. So that was my party trick then. I was going around saying, hey, do you want to see this? And I was pulling this big piece of cotton wood in, what they put right through my leg, pulling it one end of my leg to the other. That is party trick. Blagging people for money, showing them a party trick. Yeah, just like raging, crackhead style. Um, you probably feel let down a lot in your life, but see when that fucking sex case is manipulating yeah. your supposed loved ones, because I had a man on who was abused with a guy called Barry Bennell, who's just actually passed away yesterday. Oh, yeah. fucking oh did he die him? Oh, sex thank God case. For that. So yeah. I had an undercover paedophile on the guy, what, 20, 20 years undercover, yeah. pretending to be one. Wow. And what happens is he says they don't just target the kids, target the parents, yeah. the weak links, yeah. manipulate them first. Yeah, well, a lot that's... of these cunts go on dating websites or um, Facebook and they'll target parents, single mothers. Yeah, wing yourself in for a year, two year, yeah. and then target the kids. Yeah, wow. did you feel how let down did you feel when this cunt sitting in your in your living room? But was it your you stepmother? So was it your foster my, parents? My adoptive parents. Yeah, ah. at the time, um, I didn't really think much about it because I didn't really feel I didn't know the the what was wrong in it. I didn't really see the wrong in it. Do you know what I mean? I just I just thought he was a flat a friend who was like fucking doing stuff to me, you know what I mean? I didn't think of it. I didn't understand. I was too young, wasn't I? I was too young to figure it out. Um, when did you figure it out? Well, I got to about 13, 14, and then I was fuming and I was dead angry. I started getting angry thinking, what was he doing to me? But because I was embarrassed, I didn't want to tell anyone because I was embarrassed, you know what I mean? Because I felt blame myself. Um, I did, I blamed myself. Uh, and then... He died in the end before anything ever happened to him. His mum died first and then, but I was avoiding him by then and then he died. And when he died, I felt like I wanted to do so much, you know what I mean? It was like one of them, shoulda, woulda, coulda, wish I woulda done this, wish I woulda done that, do you know what I mean? But I regret. Regret, But then yeah. again, you being on the crack and getting older, you'd have been filled with more hate and rage, possibly yeah. sitting next to someone and fucking... Prison, doing a life sentence. Yeah, I would have been. Million percent. You know? Million percent, million percent. Because I was getting that way. I was doing robberies in town and thinking, it's not hard, you know, to fucking do damage to people. You know what I mean? Like, mm. petty thefts off people and all that. I was thinking, you know what? You can break the law, you know? Like, you can do things like that. I was starting to just, starting to feed that little tiny seed in my head about what I should do. 
how am I going to get like get it back or should I front it? And it, it's just too late. You know what I mean? When was the first time you spoke about that? Fucking hell, about 35, 40 years of age. Probably later. Probably yeah. to Samworth, Neil Samworth, I think I spoke to first. Never told anyone. How was that, speaking about it for the first time? <sighs> kind of yeah. ca 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 cathetic, really. Is that what you say, cathetic? Oh. Um, it felt like uh, I was just... Because I told, I told my girlfriend... But I'd never gone into detail about what happened. I just told it like I was abused as a kid, you know what I mean? Don't need to know what happened, you know? Um, but yeah, when I kind of let the cat out of the bag, it was kind of soothing. But at the same time, I feel like it's not it's not me who should be keeping secrets because I was the victim. So it's like it's like the the abuser's winning if I feel I've got to keep a secret. Do you know what I mean? Like it's me who's got to suffer i suffer with the secret keeping it a secret so if i let it out i believe that i'm letting the poison dissipate you know what i mean that's how i'm looking at it yeah yeah it's your life yeah so i'm just trying to get it out there you know just to let it fade away what happens then after you get shot after they get shot what age were you um about 25 26 um after I got shot, I didn't give a shit. I just carried on. Completely just, lost. Yeah, just stayed in the ghetto. <clears throat> um, buying drugs off people like Daryl Laycock, stuff like that, you know. Shout out to Daryl. Shout out to Daryl, Shout yeah. out to Sam as well. Yeah, shout out to Sam, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, buying crack, hanging around the back end of the gangs. Did you ever look for your mum? I was scared to. I... I I was scared to look for it because I'd always promised my adoptive mum I wouldn't go looking for her until she was dead for some reason. But my mum always said to me, Ma, if you're the lost little boy, you you need to go and look for your mum. Go and find out who you are. But I never wanted to because of... Um, I just felt I felt it'd be wrong if I tried to look for her while my mum was alive. And it was funny, I should have. I should have long before because... What happened was is I started working with um, this prison prison team. And this woman started working with me. But she was started doing a bit more than she should really. I could tell she was trying to get into me a little bit, but I wasn't sure. I wasn't sure if she was just being friendly or she was like something else. Because I got moved prisons and she started sending me money when she shouldn't have. And then... Um, started saying to me like what you're gonna do when you get out and stuff like that and i'm like me i'm just thinking about where my next pipe's coming from on discharge you know what i mean i'm not thinking about anything else and um <clears throat> she starts uh sending me money and stuff like that then before i get out of jail she says oh i can get put on your license as a condition a license so you can come and see me once a week so I go oh that's cool then twice a week um and then she says to me um what are you going to do for work? So I said, I don't know. So she said, do you want to earn £100 a day stripping the walls in my house? I live right next to Old Trafford Football Club. So I'm going to this woman's house, stripping the walls, stripping the walls, and um, getting hot and sweaty and stuff like that, and I'm taking my top off and stuff. I'm like, I can tell that she's wants it sort of thing, but she's not my type, not my cup of tea. And I wouldn't prostitute myself out to her, you know what I mean? Because that's what I felt like I'd be doing if like, I sold myself to her because I wasn't attracted to her in any way. Um, so Jen, she's got a schoolboy son in the house as well and she's trying to seduce me in the house and I'm trying to avoid it and stuff like that. So she's giving me £100 every day and it gets to New Year's Eve and I'm riding in the city centre and um, I see this guy and I hate his guts. Like he's got his girl, he's got his, um, every girl who he's ever been with, you've seen him as a prostitute, he's had him as a prostitute. His sister's a prostitute, he's had her on the game. I used to see him bullying her for money. And like, I seen him with this young girl and I walked over, while well, I was on the, my bike, I rid over and I went, yo, what are you doing with her? You better leave her alone, you. And he went, what am I doing now? And I went, I know what you're up to, you. If you fucking put her on that game, if I see that game, I'm going to smack you all over. You look right, you. 
And I've gone to her, who are you? And she's gone, hey, who are you? Proper attitude, like proper cheeky. And I've gone, hey, chill out. I'm only trying to help you. And um, he's gone in, into the, to the spa and I start speaking to her. I'm saying, what are you doing with him? He'll get you on the game, him, you know. He's a bad, bad man, him. Even though I was a raging crackhead, you know what I mean? It just wasn't my style. Or I wouldn't put girls on the game and all that. I wouldn't dream of doing that. I knew he was, so I was like, he's going to get you on the game, him smoking crack and everything. And she went, nah, not me, not me. And this girl's come over who knows me and gone, oh, he's safe, him, and all that. Give him a number anyway. And I keep thinking about her that evening. And um, I phoned her up and she starts crying, burst into tears and went, he's just battered me. So I went, where are I? And she went, I'm in the gay village. So I've ripped down to the gay village on this BMX. And um, he'd gone in a bar and one of the bouncers knew me. He went, Ma, just leave it, man. Just sort it out and that. So I took her to my friend's house. She lived in Hume, sat with her, talking to her all night, um, telling her to try and get away from this guy. You know what I mean? And like, a, there was a connection there to her straight away. You know what I mean? I felt, I felt like her energy straight away. I could tell she was struggling. So I bought her a top up and all that and said to her, look, if you need me, ring me and all that. So the next day she rung me and she burst into tears again, I think, and said, look, he battered me again, levered me. So I said, what? So I went, let me see if I can get you somewhere to stay. And I was only staying in my niece's house. Like my niece had a spare bedroom. Homeless? Yeah, I was homeless, yeah. And my niece had a spare bedroom and um, it was one of them. I said to her, do you want to put this girl up in my room she could stay in my room you know what I mean um, it's not as if like she's struggling like she's had trouble at home with her mum and dad and all like she's got nowhere to stay so she's gone nah I'm not having no fucking smackheads and all that here. and I went nah she's not on the drugs or anything she's clean like she's only young she's your age and my, my niece was like 19 at the time and um, so I knew they was close in age so I thought they were sweet so um I brought her down to my niece's house and thankfully we was getting on really well. But this woman in 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 there um, who worked for the prison was up in a game of seduction, seduction. She um every time I sat down, she'd come and sit next to me. Or like I went upstairs, I did, I followed up my stairs and start messing about in the bedroom and stuff, and I thought, fucking hell, she's trying it. Eh? But because she's paying me every day for ripping the wallpaper, I don't want to rock the boat, you know what I mean? I'm thinking it's sweet, this. So next salute, I go upstairs to the toilet and she follows me up, doesn't she? And then I go, go just go in the bathroom and the door opens and she just, I no, yeah. She comes in and throws her lips on me. Go into the bedroom, I mean, she throws her lips on me. And I think, shit, I just freeze like that. I just, that was it. She said to me, um, this up here, what do you reckon about stripping that? And she pointed to something and next minute I looked up and I turned around, she just started necking me. I thought, shit. And I froze. I was like, I froze on the spot and she jumped back and went, oh, I'm so sorry. That was so unprofessional of me. I shouldn't have done that. You know, put a proper scene on and I thought, oh, this might go all right this now. She might start treating me a bit better now. Now she knows I don't want that with her. She turned on me, man. She would switch her. She turned into a monster, started slamming doors, like looking me up and down and all that proper switched on me. She had an office in the front room, right? So she more or less lived in the back of her house. The front room was an office, all piles of paperwork. She just just run in, slam the door, all the paperwork would fly everywhere. And I'd think, whoa, she's proper angry at me. Eh? So my niece had a boyfriend. He's dead now, God rest his soul. Killed himself in prison a few months ago. Um... My niece's boyfriend going with me and I'm knocked on the door and she's opened the door and she went, who's this? And I went, I've just brought my niece's boyfriend to help me do the stripping. She went, I didn't let it tell you to bring anyone to this house. She got me recalled to prison. She told me probation officer, oh, I can't work with him. He's this, he's this, he's that. I'm, I'm sat there one day at home, next next minute, the police come knocking and nick me, breach of my... Breach of my License conditions because of her. She preached me on my bail. So I'm back in custody then. So How long for? Nine months I go to prison for. And within that nine months, I get to know Kira. And um, she starts telling me stories about... She starts telling me stories about what's happened to her in the past and stuff. So 
she broke down in tears and told me that um, that guy who she was with, he'd been beating her up since she was 15. And then not only that, he'd been like doing like uh, bad things to her. Like he'd been been doing a, a monster, you know, he was a monster. He was a sex offender. And when I, I was in prison and she said to me, look, Ma, I've got something to tell you. Like, um, he's not only been beating me up, like he's been like forcing me to have sex and he was forcing me when I was 15. As soon as she said that, I said, you know what, girl? He's a sex offender. You need to get him locked up because no man can go with a girl at 15. He's 39. Yeah, he's a nonce. He's a nonce. It's a sex offender. Just because you, you've rolled into 16, 17 now, because you've been with him a few years, that doesn't mean it makes it any better. He was still a sex offender when he was good with you. When he knew he was 15, please go to work, because she was working with this um, child protection team, because they'd already been on her, because they know that he was an animal. She'd been around him for a while, I didn't know. And it turns out that he'd had other girls in his house. He was runaways and he was forcing other girls to come round to his house and all that. So when she told me that and she was away from him, I begged her to get him locked up. I said, listen. And she went, no, no, because it's grass. And I went, it's not grassing, girl. That's the, that's the thing you don't understand. You know, grassing sex offenders, it doesn't work like that. And they're not criminals. They work, They live on different wings to us. They build prisons for sex offenders so prisoners cannot get to them because when we get to them, we eat them alive like a piranha on a fish. So we had to convince her that they don't live with us there on a separate wing. You know, the sex offenders, it, there's no such thing as grass in a sex offender. Do you know what I mean? It doesn't, there's no such thing. There's no such thing. So I convinced her to um, report him and... He got six and a half years, so he was doing a lot of naughty things, okay? And that was with a deal and all that, you know what I mean? That was with him not not going guilty some, for some of the worst charges. So uh, I was still an addict, though, and I'm um, trying my best, you know? I'm trying to live a straight life. I'm trying to, trying to earn money for crack and then go home at night or go home after a couple of days and um, try and live a normal life, try and not smoke crack and walk my dog and stuff like that. And uh, at the time, I'm, I didn't, I, I didn't know whether I wanted to live or die. I kept thinking, is death easier than life? I was questioning that a lot. And um, I didn't know whether, I didn't know whether it was worth living or not. There was a lot of people dying of. Um, overdoses and stuff a lot of people die in the drug game your friends are dying regular you know especially those who inject and stuff like that you see a lot of people go you know and i was thinking wow is this how i'm gonna die like am i gonna die of an heart attack of the crack and stuff like that and i kept thinking to myself marv like you've got to change you've got to change you know what i mean and my bird's family like obviously she'd got back speaking to them they were safe with me uh, my bird's dad like he treated me like a son, you know what I mean? And he knew I was an addict even like, and um, he trusted me impeccably and stuff like that. And he was dying of a terminal disease. So watching him, watching him have a terminal illness and watching everything kind of crumble around me, I felt like it was I was duty bound to try and do my part and get clean, do you know what I mean? And I struggled fought the crap tried to get clean doing normal days having days off and then going back waking up the next morning seeing a bit of sig ash on the floor and being triggered by it and or somewhere walking town and someone had gone mafia yeah, there's a there's a phone number there and there was a piece of crack wrapped up in it you know what i mean and set me off again all like the, the thought i'd just get the better of me and i just want to smoke crack and i'd just climb windows or climb walls to get to it and um i was I wasn't happy. Um, you said say though? Uh, I wasn't suicidal. I, I felt like it was going to kill me anyway. I felt like I was going to die at any minute. Yeah, smoking crack is basically fucking yeah. self-harming. Yeah, it's self-harming. Yeah, I was putting bigger pipes. Any sort of drugs you're taking, self-harming. Yeah, I was putting bigger and bigger pipes on. How much were you smoking a day? Anywhere from a one or two, seven, eight hundred quid a day. Whatever I made, I'd smoke on crack. You know what I mean? As much money as I made and I was grafting all day. 
Um, what happened that, when you were in the jail? Were you going, were you going clean? I loved it in the jail. Loved it. How many, was, you, how many times you get the jail? 20, 20, 30? 20, 30 times, yeah. I What's loved your it biggest time. sentence? Four. Got a four. Done three year, one month off of four for selling drugs in Moss Side. Got nicked on a drug operation in the end in Moss Side. Why did you enjoy prison? It felt like home, James. It felt like home. I was born there. Do you know what I mean? I was born there. It was my place that, you know what I mean? I'd go on the wings and everyone would like, yes, Marv's back on the wing. You know what I mean? I'd walk on the wings and like the old jail, the, like the wing would be banging because Marv would come back on the wing because I'd just be a buzz, you know what I mean? Like backflips off the landings and jumping in the dryer and fucking having the wing firing and selling drugs and all that and just mad ones selling furniture. You know what I mean? snotting subutex and fucking smoking weed and subutex, getting throwovers and Tem Jesic and all that the t North East Temis Tem remember Tem Jesic boy they was they was flooded the jails them years ago Tem Jesic were you not a debt collector in prison? yeah I was a debt collector as well yeah I used to nip around and get the debts for the people you know what I mean Um not something I'm proud of that though really James it's just, just necessary and it? it's a very very tough place prison People on the out won't really, won't really relate. Yeah, a fucking debt collector. But you know, when someone owes someone a one and they don't really want to pay it and they need convincing, I'd go in and convince them. Do you know what I mean? And uh, they'd be, I'd have ways of making them pay, you know. What were like, you? Just scare them, you know what I mean? Just threaten them. Threaten to like, take, just, just threaten them to do something, you know what I mean? Seems heavy on your heart that you've done that. Yeah, it was very heavy, yeah. It was hard, hard having to do that. Now in retrospect, you know what I mean? Scaring people and that, you know, like, but you've got to pay your bills or she's just going to get hurt, you know what I mean? Or, because I see the sadness in you, bro. I yeah, see it. Yeah. Like, being an addict and being everything you threw, I can understand why you were angry. I can understand why you done bad shit to try and survive. Yeah. Because you're angry at the world. You feel let down. You feel lost. You feel yeah. alone. Yeah. And that's a horrible place to be. It is. Where's my mum? Where's my dad? Why did yeah. they not love me? Was it me? What yeah. did I do wrong? Yeah, that's The constant it. questions, the constant darkness, the yeah. constant trying to get away from the pain. That's it, yeah. I'd done a homeless documentary and it was like a world within a world. After about three, four days, I actually felt homeless. I actually yeah, felt, well, at, when I was waking up in the morning, I thought, is this a dream or wow. I've actually lost my shit? Wow. I'm starting to think, yeah, wow. Well, is this, uh, am I homeless? Yeah, well, Because it's the, the, you don't sleep, it's like every no. 20 minutes, little yeah, bus, because yeah. I was always on edge. Yeah. If somebody fucking tries to plug me yeah, when I'm course, sleeping, or, yeah, yeah. And it was just, it was, it was a horrible feeling because yeah. even though I was doing it seven days, I felt, what if people forgot about me? Yeah. Where's my family? Yeah. Is this a dream? Or is it real? Or, That's it. And it's scary to think, if I was feeling alone, even though I was going home after seven days yeah. at Christmas, how are, would it be for somebody who's been on the streets for 20 years, yeah, that's 30 it, yeah. years, yeah. who are alone, not yeah. got anybody to turn yeah, to, it, yeah. not got anywhere to go on Christmas Day. No, that's it, yeah. It's a horrible place, life yeah. sometimes. And yeah, of course. It's also a beautiful journey. It's, it's, a, it's a mixture of emotions, life, if we're honest. Mm. It takes us on so many journeys, but mm. I can see the struggle in your eyes. Yeah, yeah. I can, bro. Yeah. I'm not going to yeah, sit course, here and yeah, bullshit course, you, and, course, I, and yeah. it's totally understandable. Yeah. But don't forget how far you've come into what you're doing now. Yeah, of course. See, when you... You think about the past as well. Does yeah. it play a burden on your heart? It can do. Can Not just do. the stuff that people's done to you, but the stuff you've done to others. Yeah, both. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I mean, I've there's a there's a memory wall in near the, there's an office next to Strangeways, and it's got pictures of everyone who's died in drugs of prison and on the street. And my God, it breaks my balls. What looking at it because I see loads of faces that I know, and I know I gave him spice, and I know I was smoked crap with him, and I know I used to have a buzz with him, and I know I sold him spice in jail, and I just think, wow, I wonder if I killed them people. Do you know Why I mean? do you think you're still alive? To do what I'm doing now, to spread the word that no matter what you've been through, you can be through the worst of the worst. You can you can make it through and turn it around anytime you want. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I mean, um, I was talking about that burn before, weren't we, on my back? All right. That burn on my back gave me so much trouble as a kid because I'd think to myself, who's burnt me? Who, what did I do that wrong? Was I that? I don't know. Was there, was there something wrong with me? Why Why would someone put a cigarette on, on my back? Looks like a cigar. Hmm. It's a big burn. It's not a cigarette yeah. burn. would be a wee. Yeah. A big, it's, it's a stub a out, in it? Yeah, like a stub I, out. Yeah, it's not somebody's it's skimmed you. It's been... Yeah, it's proper put out, yeah. in it? 
that's what I mean, yeah. And that's what I mean. My mum, my adoptive mum always said, Marv, I never burnt you, love. It wasn't me. You know, she called me Marvin. She put Lee at the beginning of my name, but she never called me Lee. No one ever called me Lee. Only police, everyone calls me Marvin because my birth mum called me Marvin. Um, so, yeah, I used to question who burnt me with the cigarette a lot. And um, that that's hard to deal with. And I've never been able to solve it, you know what I mean? Because when I went searching for my mum, my adoption agent said, Worked with him for years, man. And she said to me, right, I'm going to open your adoption file for you now. You officially open it. Went away buzzing. She phoned me up and said, I've got some news coming on Tuesday. So what? And then she went, she was sad and I was buzzing. Me and my bird thinking, well, I'm going to meet my mum soon. And she went, I've got some so sorry. Yeah. And just passed me a piece of paper. And I thought, what the fuck's this? And it was my mum's death certificate. And she went, I'm so sorry, your mum was dead. Uh, I couldn't tell you before, you know, there's the reason, and there's when she died. She died within weeks of my, my adoptive mum dying. So she died weeks apart, 2003, years before, you know what I mean? I'm thinking, no, within weeks of them dying together. Do you know what I mean? Even so though you I, never knew your mum, did you still feel heartbroken because of yeah, unanswered questions? Yeah, plung, plunged me into depression, James. I never knew what depression was until that happened. Because I sat there with, with headphones on and I was just blank in the world. I didn't want to speak to Kira. I had my dog next to me and I just felt like uh, I didn't want to deal with anyone. I just had enough of everybody. I didn't want to deal with anyone. I didn't want to talk to no one. And my, my missus is going, what's the matter with you? didn't even know her. And you know what I mean? She mum in it. So... So I can remember my, the last time my mum held me in her arms and I've said it and I'll say it on every podcast and I can. Um, it's somewhere in my memory bank here in my brain. Every time when I say it, I remember it here, but I don't know if I was looking there when I was a baby looking up. I don't know what it is, but somewhere in my psyche, I can feel the last time I was in my mum's arms. You know what I mean? I can feel like the distressing energy and it's never left me that, you know? Um, so that energy I can feel that a lot how old was she when she had you teenage 17 18 and what was she in prison for theft theft it said she was doing I think it was nine months I've said six it's either six or nine um were you pregnant pregnant yeah heavily so pregnant she was out stealing to try and survive basically yeah well that's what I mean um she was out heavily pregnant um and then she got nicked for theft and then my dad was in prison as well because I've spoke I've heard since that they was both in custody when I was born um but my mum was an escapee from a woman's prison in London that's that that's what my birth family have told me my mum was an escapee from a prison in London that's why she went up south she was up there so obviously she had me adopt um she had me in style Wimslow Cheshire and then went back to London then and then signed the signed the adoption fight paperwork. But it's a one it's a weird one because like I say I've met this guy who's claimed to be my dad since and he said to me, it was a good thing you never came to London because you'd have been dead. So I said, what do you mean? He went, uh, one day we was all taking drugs in this house. We was in so and so's house and we was all smashed out of our heads. And she had a baby in a cot. And he said we was all gouching and the baby was dead in the cot. And I picked the baby up and the baby was blue. This was his words. Pick the baby up, the baby was blue. I told everyone in the house the baby was dead. That had been you. That's what he said to me. And I was like, wow, fucking hell. Who's baby? This is what I mean. He, my, my dad, when I met him, said that I would have been that dead baby if that was me. Because he was, this is what happened. He'd Years before, he'd been in a drug house with my adoptive mum. I mean, with my birth mum, sorry. My real dad and my... And he was taking drugs in an house. And the, the woman in the house had a baby. And he what he said, the, he woke up and the baby was dead in the cot and he picked the baby up blue. And he went, that would have been you. Not, think he's just made that up to make it. I ain't got a clue, James, if he made it it's up. fucking not. scary, that. That's what he said to me. He said, lucky it wasn't you, because that would have been you. So how, did you, how did you come across him? 
Well, my aunties, um, I'd still been in contact with, not been in contact with him, but I think he turned up at my mum's funeral, uh, summit, when my mum died many years before. So I think they still had his details and his number and whatnot, and um, they contacted him. To cut a long story short, I'm sat there with him, and he starts telling me that uh, he used to, Call my mum every name under the sun for giving me away. I used to call your mum every fucking name under the sun. And I've thought to myself, why though? Is that a good thing? Is that something you're proud of? Calling my mum for giving me away, you know what I mean? Like, she must have been traumatised enough without you fucking pounding her head, you know what I mean? And um, I don't know if he's my dad to this day, because what happened was the first, very first time I met him, I'm on the phone, he's on the phone, our first ever meeting, just me and him talking, and he starts talking about Valium to someone, and I know that I can get Valium, you know, on the counterfeit mile near Strangeways Prison. Um, so I just start convers. I don't know what to, else to say to him, basically, James, I just can't think of anything to say to him. And out of conversation, I just say, um, yeah, you know, you can. I can get them, them Valleys, they're cheap near me. Oh, can you, son? Oh, can you? Oh, yeah, get me some. Get me some. F fucking phone me up a couple of days later. How are you? All right. Yeah, have you got them tablets? You got them tablets? On the way to getting them tablets, I lost 20 quid. I knew that Earth or the energy was just going to go foul. I just knew something was going to go pear shape. But I let it happen. And um, it got into my auntie's compound in the gardens, what my auntie's got an house, big house in the compound. He's got in the compound, went in the toilet, got smashed out of his head. Come sat back down in the garden with me and Kieran, started telling us that he used to force guns to women in women's mouths and he put guns to women's throat to force them to get take drugs and forces them onto the beat. And he was a cunt back in the day and he still got women now and... And he was telling me and my girlfriend these stories, my Kira, after he knows what she's been through. And Kira just stood up in disgust and walked off. And he went, oh, fuck, you know, I shouldn't really have been saying that type of stuff, to us, should I? And I went, not really, no. And anyway, he's supposed to have come for a DNA test and he just let me down. He's supposed to have come to my auntie's office for a DNA test one day. Went to the office, I waited for him from two, three, four, five, six, seven, he never turned up. I felt like a little kid again, a little boy waiting for his dad, do you know what I mean? He abandoned me again, and to this day, I don't, I do not know if that man is my dad or not, because he never turned up for the DNA test. Do you want him to be your dad though? No, I don't really, I don't. The only reason I wanted him to be my dad is because he told me he's got a son and a daughter who are 10 years younger than me. And apparently they don't want to meet me until they know that he's definitely my dad. So, so we do a DNA with you two then? And but I don't know who they are and I never know who they're going to be because he's fucked me off now. He's just swerved me now. Um, you never know so, who's watching if you want to say his name. I don't want to say his nah. name. It's no part. I don't even know his name, to be <laughs> honest. I don't know. He gave me two names. I don't know if his name's Eric or George. There you go. So the honest to God, I don't know if the man's called Eric or George. Because that's what he told me two names. So to this day, he's never I've never found out if what his real name is. So, so you coming from the broken home and you're in a crack den and you're being shot and you're in and out of prison. See, when you were lying mad with it, did you ever just wish your mum or your dad would come and yeah. take you and say everything will be okay? Yeah, that's what I always thought would happen. I always thought that um, I'd be swept up and everything would be happy ever after. I really did believe that. You know what I mean? Um. I always thought that. I always knew that everything what I do was come back, comes back round. You know, just this big karmic wheel that we all have to bear. So I knew all the badness what I'd done had come back round, but I'd never done anything bad enough to cause this. You know what I mean? I've such a traumatic life. You know do you have what I mean? A question: Why me? Yeah, of course. I question that a lot, yeah, but now I feel like I've been blessed by giving the opportunity to spread my story. Because it's not, you'll question, why did they let me go? Why did they not fight and yeah. protect me? But can you understand why your mum did give you up? 
when you yeah. kind of went down that same path like yeah. can you imagine being a father yeah. being on the crack and yeah and i can understand why she did it yeah especially ease the pain a bit it does yeah especially because i met my dad as well and he's still on drugs and that and he's still on the crack and he's still on the smack and that especially and if he's talking of, about a dead baby then i know it could have been you it could have been me yeah that's what i mean i don't think he was lying when he said that you know what i mean i don't think he was lying i think he meant every word and then when he started saying that he used to get at my mum for giving me away i kind of made me cringe with him you know what i mean i kind of you know like oh like, why would you do that you know but like i say i'm planned kind of probably blindly bleeding loyal to my mum you know what i mean i don't don't want to hear nothing wrong said about it you know what i mean when it, you know where probably there's a lot of things to be said about her really you know what i mean yeah because you don't know what she went through her life and her upbringing and you don't being in prison and being a runaway as well and trying well, to she never she away. never lived after that though she never lived after giving me away james she never married she never had a relationship Any proper no no other kids nothing every photograph i've got of her she's hugging other kids every single photograph did she ever get clean no never got clean I don't think she ever got clean do you feel as if if you ever met her that you both could have got clean together is that ever a dream that would have been a dream yeah but I think to myself if I would have met her while I was on crack I'd have been smoking I'd have been um, I think I think it would have just all been just a drug a drug thing it would have turned into a drug thing you know what I mean because I was very kind with my crack me like if I made money, I'd just go and find someone and say, you can smoke with me, you know what I mean? Just give them pipe after pipe, fuck all. And then get bored of them, you know what I mean? Just fuck them off. Um, when were you at your loneliest? Um, at my loneliest? Wow. Um, I don't know. I don't know if I've ever felt lonely or not. I, I, I questioned, I, 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 I gave myself a very, very deep question when I was young. And I said, to myself I'm either part of everything and everything's part of me or I'm part of nothing and I, I have to be a part of something because I can't be a part of everything uh, nothing do you know what I mean I've got to be a part of everything like the workings of the universe I've got a tip for me because if they don't then I don't know what I'm here for do you know what I mean um, so I believe I've been put here for a reason to spread this message that no matter where you've been in your life and how low and how sad and dark it is you can turn it around whenever you want you can make things better you can tell yourself to that you can make things better you know self-talk is like having a conversation with the universe isn't it yeah it's so important, man words are powerful what yeah. you are you, you are what you speak and i always repeat that That's stuff it, and yeah, so. if i can repeat it I'll, enough then maybe it'll sink into someone just yeah. be careful what you're talking be careful what yeah. you're putting into the universe yeah. and your prime example no matter how what age you are how fucked up your past is you can make changes to better your life you can yeah. even though it's 20 30 40 years are wrong you can can't you james yeah, of course you, you can, don't you, even if you're 70 you yeah. can change yeah. can't you there's people 70 80 90 learning new languages running marathons exactly yeah it's all down to how you believe it and That's putting it. it into action action is so important because we can yeah. all talk shit yeah and we all talk shit that's we all it, talk yeah. shit that's yeah. my job is course, to talk shit and course, people, yeah. i feel as if why does people buy into my shit talk yeah <laughs> i genuinely do i think yeah. am i feeling everybody yeah do you know what i mean but there must be something in it and i'm just i'm not trying to find all the answers and all the keys to all the locks yeah. i'm just trying to find enough that people can get something from it to then have a better life yeah and i'm working on that okay i've changed this change this change this change yeah. this it's given me a better life. I'm, I'm flying, but there's more to it. There's more there's to it. There's a bigger package. There's more to yes. it. You've got to put on top of the fucking omelette. Oh, yeah, of course. Make it yeah. Nice. So Mine's not finished yet. My journey's not even started yet. I mean, I've just had to put my dad in a care home. The one who used to beat me as a kid. I've had to put him in a care home. But it's funny because before I put him in the care home, he was pissing and shitting, and I'm having to clean it after he used to beat me for pissing myself. So when I used to wee, the, wee myself or wee the bed, I'd get a beating for it. But then I've got to find that, uh, I've got to find that compassion to treat him with respect and think, oh, you know, clean it up for him and 
Stay all right, Dad. It's okay. Don't worry. It's all right. You know, but to me, he'd be like, what you done, boy? How come you have peace? I am uh, you stinking. And that's what I'd get. You know what I mean? It's mad though how life goes full circle. You yeah. born shitting yourself. Yeah. And you go out shitting yourself. That's it, yeah. That's crazy. Crazy, man. Yeah. So, yeah. That's exactly it. Yeah, crazy. So, I've had to just, on all his family, because like I've never had a relationship with his family, really, because I was on drugs from very young. So, they all kind of didn't want to know me anyway. But all his family had just left me to do every last thing myself. But yeah, it is what it is. Story's not over yet. Um, What's the worst thing you've seen in prison? I watched someone's head get squashed in a door, dead. In this, like, just someone held him. T- I, like, I, I, Wolverhampton, like, there was all the tenor off some kid. The kid didn't pay it, and the kid's gone in to sort it out, and he had a little argument, and he slammed the door on the kid's head on the way out. He's at the floor. Guy's head was there on the door and he just went bang, slammed the door on the way out and just crushed his head in the door. He's dead. Shout black blood on the on the landing. Um I watched someone's head get smashed with I, I watched a sinking forest bank get smashed with someone's head as well once. Like oh, naughty man. No uh, the shout had gone up that like he was a nonce and about three lads just went in on this fella and just smashed smashed a sink. Big marble sinks in that forest bank. Yeah, if he was, you off. don't you don't mind that. But again, it's a shout to put Fucking out in case he wasn't. Imagine if he wasn't. Man. Yeah. Fucking hell, because that happens a lot as well. Um, yeah, I was. I, you know what? Uh, jail for me was quite um, quite the experience. I mean, I got nicked for inciting a riot in Strange Rays once. Some one of my codies said to me, "Man, of course I'd seen what get his bird off the phone." Me like a dickhead picked up a metal stacking chair and started smacking it against the, the stairs. It's kicking off. Come on, let's go, lads. Hey. And thought, man, the panic alarm went. And I thought, shit. I was thinking in the back of my mind, was that me who's just caused that? Went by my door, got up six o'clock in the morning. I just felt my ears getting risen like this. And I thought, someone's holding my ears. A pure scoozer just got me and picked me up, marched me to the block, charged me with. Um, Attempting to incite a riot in strange ways of all things. Fuck, you know. 28 days down the block, me below the paedophiles. <laughs> Flagging them for cigarettes. It was murder trying to get a cig off, I'm all honest. What's the worst thing about prison, Marv? Your freedom. Your freedom. There's nothing worse than you just being there on with your thoughts um, and being away. Being away that you just can't get there. I mean, Strange Ways is the worst because you can more or less hear the nightlife of Manchester from Strange Ways. Um, your freedom is what kills you the most. Breaks you feel, your heart. Do you feel as if that was the first time you had a family when you were in prison? Possibly, yeah. That's a funny, that's a strange way of looking at it. But yeah, I guess it was my family, yeah. There was my family in prison. I mean, I'd go to prison and the lads had searched me out. Like, Marv, get on air, come on our wing, come on air, you know, you know what I mean? Because I was the laugh, the loudest and the fucking brashest and the gamest. That's the weakest. Yeah, it is, yeah. It's the weakest, yeah. It's the one with the most to hide, isn't it? Yeah. The one hiding the most, right? Mm-hmm. Do you feel, it's, it's, it's mad because when you have addictions, you feel like the loudness and the daftness is the mask. The mask, It's it once is. you actually start changing, uh, so I can it's walk into a room now, I can, I know. Yeah. I know. Yeah, you know. I feel it, like, I know. So you know, I've been that clown, I've been the circus yeah, act. Yeah. I'd have been best just joining the circus and yeah. I'd have been getting paid. Yeah. <laughs> because the laugh and the daftness and the yeah. <clears throat> I don't give a fucking full of Charlie yeah. and the drink. Yeah, it's all a mask. I'm, I'm broken. It's a mask. I'm scared. Isn't it? Cause you feel you're getting fired in people. You're like I say, it's a circus act. Yeah. Big Marvel do it. Yeah. That's um, it. Do it. You're smashing up rights and and fucking the whole for, for months on worst. end and you think it's it's great yeah. everybody's what a PC but people just know yeah. that you're up for it yeah, you're for getting it. used that's it mate yeah I know I know I quite, I've got to understand that of the way life works you know when did that understanding start to come um, quite recently really uh, but you know I'm grateful for the journey what I've been on I mean I've been on some mad journey um, I remember getting beat um, I remember a kid running up to me, smashing my head with a brick a few years ago because he'd give me drugs to sell. I'd seen him the other day in town. It's funny, and he's like, wow, do you remember that drugs? I was like, yeah, man, it was just about them, wasn't it? I was 
bang at it. And it just felt like it was somebody else talking to him, you know what I mean? Even though this guy smashed me about with a brick, like literally sniped me, jumped out of a car and ran up to me and hit me out of the head with a brick. I still fucking laughed with him and had a buzz with him. I just thought, wow, you fucking madman. But it's me who's the madman, isn't it? You know what I mean? For taking a whack around the head with a brick a few times for a bit of drugs. Um, and don't get me started on that drugs fucking issue because I've got a lot to say on that. I mean, they're keeping us, they're keeping people slaves to it, aren't they? Yeah. Keep by league, keeping it illegal and stuff. It's the biggest organisation, brother. The biggest, man. The prison, private money. prisons, Trousers. the money in the prisons. Prison the money in slavery, man. Yeah, prison 40 slavery. Grand, 50 grand inmates per year. Yeah. People working for buttons. Working for two, three pound a day, aren't you? Yeah, it's slavery. Two pound a day. Talk about slavery is gone. It's not slavery's gone. Slavery's still, still here. Slavery's there. If you it? understand private life, prison, yeah, yeah, man, they're making money off the weak, yeah. off the vulnerable. Addicts shouldn't have been in prison. No. They need help. No drug addict should be in prison. They need help. No Listen, way. they've done bad shit. We get it and we yeah. don't understand your yeah. story. But yeah. 80% of kids who are, as, who did they have on? 80% of kids who are in prison yeah. come from a broken home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's it, yeah. And you know, um, you can't blame the drugs, mate, because it's everywhere, isn't it? The drugs mm. are everywhere. Yeah. You know, I mean, when I started, when I tried crack, it was that brand new. You couldn't buy it after 10 o'clock at night. From my estate, I had to go and travel all all over Manchester to buy it. Do you know what I mean? Like, mm. just that, uh, you know, and that was just um, people trying to earn a few quid off it and like the dangers of it. All right, then you can go and buy alcohol, which is danger. You can put alcohol on the table with weed and you show me which one's danger. You know what I mean? Every 99.9 .9 people are going to say the alcohol's the dangerous one out there, but the, the cannabis is the illegal one. It's funny, isn't it? Eh? Mm -hmm. You know, like you say, it's just all money, profits, and business. Yeah, man. Listen, alcohol is one of the biggest killers in men. It, is. it kills 40,000 every year. You've got cigarettes, you've got vapes, you've got yeah. everything that's... You've, even sugar. Yeah. Sugar's just as Sugar's big as well. It's, you can go down the rabbit hole of it, why it's yeah. there. But again, it's to suppress the human mind of thinking for itself. Yeah. Because if you're craving something, your free thinking goes. Yeah. And that's yeah. the sad thing. Yeah. When did you have a realisation that you were fucking up, that your life was lost, you were a lost soul. I was on Spice. <clears throat> what was Spice uh, like? Fucking hell, Spice is like another planet, mate. Yeah, thank fuck, mate, I wasn't on it when Spice was about, man. Oh, God, man, that Spice was just something else, mate. <laughs> <laughs> I'm laughing, mate, because I know fucking how fucked hell. I was. I'll tell you what, I was lucky as fuck, because I was in a cell with this scouser. Big up, what his name is, can't remember now. When it come on the wing, Spice. I got a big ball for this kid. He went, Marv, don't start doing it in, lad. Like all these fucking Muppets on the wing, lad. Just put a tiny bit in and see what it does to you. And I put the tiniest amount in and sat there. And I felt my arms like robocopping, like. <laughs> That's what it felt like. My arms were just going. <laughs> you know, it's just like the blood rushing through your body. And I felt like robocop, like, wow, this is great. This fucking strong as fuck. And then. I'm getting it in the jail and um, I get out and I say to my missus, fucking hell, man, fuck the crack now. I'm smoking spice from now on. I've had enough of the crack. Cheaper as well, huh? Yeah, and I never, ever touched the crack again. I smoked spice for about a year and a half, two years. Still legal. Um, and it was cooking me from the inside out. I mean, I was waking up. I never knew what anxiety was. I was waking up with anxiety, like through the roof, just having a mad attack. Couldn't breathe. Couldn't breathe, couldn't speak. Just spinning around on my bed, burning up, like just sweating like buckets and buckets and buckets off the spice. And my missus is phoning ambulances and as soon as the air is on the spice, like, oh, fuck it, we're going. Honestly, they literally were just like, what's up, what's up? And then she'd go, it's not that spice. I'd go, oh, fuck that, we're gone. And just leave you there and just go. Because they knew the spice was just giving everyone panic attacks. And you couldn't buy it in Manchester City Centre. So I was going to this shop on the outskirts of Manchester, saying to these guys, give us some testers. Let me go and take it to Manchester and give it the boys to try. Fuck, you know. So they're giving me little gram packets. And then I, the more I'm getting into them, the more friendly they become in. In the end, they start selling me 20 gram, three grams of spice for six pound 50. Do you know what I mean? And it was labeled up at 20 pound. So I can buy three grams for six pound 50. So I was going every day and buying like 10 gram of spice, taking testers into town, giving people it and going home and smoking the rest. 
and acting like a lunatic in the house because it was that strong. I felt like my head was going to explode. Um, but I stopped eating and everything else and I was going yellow then. And my missus was saying to me, Marv, that is killing you. That if any drug has ever been killing you, it's the spice. And I went, I oh, know I've got to stop it. And then one day I just threw all of it in buckets of water and launched it and never touched it again. And um, touch wood, I've not touched anything again. Still got re did, you ever, did you ever go to rehab or any meetings? No, I went to NA. <clears throat> but me like a dickhead, I took crack to NA. <laughs> so I was smoking crack in the toilets before I was going into the bleeding rooms, you know what I mean? So I felt bad about after the fact. Imagine how many people are triggered. That's what I used to think, you know what I mean? But it was the only place I could smoke crack. I was with my missus and she wanted me to go NA. So it was only three, two hours I could get out of the day, you know what I mean? Yeah. To go and get a couple of pipes. But you'll get people who go to meetings to serve up. Yeah, you will, yeah. Of course. Because it's, it's, yeah, it's a fucking busy place. Drug mate. addicts, yeah, it? Drug yeah, so place, it? Everyone it's wants e drugs there. It's easy to manipulate. And how was yeah. it coming off everything? It was quite easy, you know, to be honest. Um, what you're on now? Nothing now. Just a legal weed prescription. And that's for that. pain. Yeah, that's all I take now. Yeah, I don't drink alcohol or anything else. Any medication other than... Yeah, I'm on medication. Yeah, what sort of stuff? Because um, I can see it in your eyes. You can see it, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You can see it in my head and everything, yeah. I'm on pain medications. Um what you on what you, where are you on pain? I've got a spine disease. Um so I've got to take this medication twice a day. Otherwise I can't walk. I've got sciatica as well. Um so okay, it's excruciating pain down my legs, you know what I mean? So I'm on like hundred mil of morphine, morphine tablets, which are very, very strong. They knock me out at night. Sometimes I can't even stay awake at night. Which is a difficulty, but it's catch-22 because I've had a screaming pain all day or to take the morphine, do you know what I mean? It's built up I've, over the years. I didn't want to take painkillers. I, I was refusing them at first, and the doctors were like, look, you need to manage your pain here, you know what I mean? Look at that, I just had a mad panic attack again. I have these all the time. Though. What's that with? I think it's the spice. I've never, they've never stopped since I've got, been on the spice. Everyone tells me just take your coat off, but it's not as easy as yeah, that. Do you want to open a window or anything? Yeah, no, it's all right. I'm good. I gather them about 10 times a day, these I've had since I started taking spice. Since I started using spice, I get them about 10 times a day at the minute. Just wear them out like I'm in a swimming bath, just soaking up like that. How's your live on, on finger the other day? Go on, sorry. How's your anger and stuff? My anger's calm. It's calm. I've never been an angry person, me. Um, I can control that a lot, do you know what I mean? Like, I'm not one for it in my missus and all that. I've never been a violence. We've not been into violence and all that. I've never done all that. Um, so I'm quite calm in that respect, I think. But, yeah, I can turn on a penny. My finger can go through the roof very quickly, you know what I mean? But, yeah, I'm quite a calm person. I don't like hurting people, do you know? I've never been, I've never been a, a hater, you know what I mean? I've always been, like, a lover type, you know what I mean, Jane? Mm hmm like my missiles will tell you, I've never hit her and all that, you know what I mean, never used violence, it's not me, I'm, she wears the trousers, I don't, you know. You ever done therapy? Um, I've talked to people about my problems, but I've never really got into it too much. This Why? is my therapy, I think. Just speaking like this? Yeah, this is it, yeah. Because it's a dark story, Marv. You know this yourself, it's dark, mate. It Born is. in prison, what chance you got? Know, Do you know what I mean? Know. That's the case of where does a guy go from here? And then everything that you went through, you could understand if you were angry. You could yeah, understand I if know. you thought, fuck this, I'm taking mm. cunts out with me. I know, I know. Do you know what I mean? People have asked me that. Why have you not just gone mad down, gone sick? And I just, just not in me to do that. You know what I mean? It's not in me to do that. Just <laughs> not that kind of person. Yeah. So how's life now? Life's good now. Babies, babies, uh, nearly four um health wise it's not good i've got a frontal lobe brain tumor you know what i mean what i get checked every year and they put this dye in my, my veins to see if the tumor's grown and if when it grows to a point where it's gonna pop and it's gonna do me in it is what it is but as of yet it's not done that yet do you know what i mean so every year i get that checked um the pain in my back is what it is, but I'm just living day to day, you know what I mean? Happy that I've found all my answers of my birth family, got all the answers I need. Now I've got my family of my own to look after, you know what I mean? A bit of closure with the family that you had? Yeah, I mean, yeah, they've spoke to me and got got to know them a little bit and got to know my cousins and all that, which is nice, do you know what I mean? 
How was it having a son? Did you ever, was it ever a worry that you could have ended up like your dad or your mum? Not yeah. to disrespect them, but yeah. you know what I mean? Kind of yeah, yeah. down that route of in prison, an addict, yeah. having to give your son up. Yeah, I've always thought that it would have went like that, but thank God we've never um, never been that, that way, you know what I mean? Um, I'm, I had a son when I was like 17, um, never really got on. I wish I could link up with him again, you know what I mean? That's one of my biggest regrets, you know, not connecting with my son, being on drugs when he was growing up. Now I'm not on drugs now, you know what I mean? But now he's got a family of his own. Don't think he want to know me now. But my new son, my little four-year-old, nearly four, he's autistic, got his own little issues, you know what I mean? Behavioural issues. But we're just trying to give him as much love and attention as we can and affection. Wow. Yeah, family's what it's all about. How was yeah. that with having a son at 17? Because it's a kind of same patterns as your mum. Yeah, it was. Same. Chose drugs over family. Yeah, yeah. And she went, she, he, he, he kind of um, sided with his mum. You know what I mean? He sided with his mum. Because she's there though. Yeah, she's there, yeah. So. And this is what people need to understand, single mothers how hard that is and we talk yeah. about masculinity and men mm, build the mm. world and men go and find mm, the women in it majority of men are in prisons the majority of men are homeless the majority mm. of men are suicidal mm. but has men ever fucking been pregnant have they ever raised it, yeah. a son or a you're daughter right. alone right. have right. they ever breastfed every hour hour mm. and a half mm. have they ever trying to work two jobs while providing true, for their family true, yeah. we talk about men being strong mm. Women are stronger than men. Course, in my yeah, opinion, yeah. yes, men have got masculinity and we need masculinity. Mm. I believe men are becoming soft as fuck. Mm. We need to grow a set of balls. Of but women, on the other hand, yeah. they talk about men being strong. The what women do to give birth is I can't I can't on um, it's how the body functions, how know, it, everything it. functions and how the breasts grow to yeah, give milk crazy, and how the, the, the umbilical cord is feeding the, the baby nutrients yeah, and then incredible. giving birth and then mm. having to feed the baby every hour, hour mm. and a half and the stresses that goes on in their body, the wow. energy it takes. I know, mate. Wow. Women are strong, man. And, I, and as I'm learning that, as I get older mm. and understanding how birth and stuff works. Yeah, it's mind-blowing, it's, isn't it? It's unbelievable. And yeah, women, it's a blessing. In life, men and women need each other. Yeah. But women are a lot stronger than what they, yeah. sh they should get credit yeah. for. Yeah, they're a lot stronger than we give them credit for. Yeah, as well, I think so. <laughs> but does that play a massive part now that you're becoming clean and understanding yeah. life? Where, but if does your son know your story? Must which one? My youngest, yeah, oldest, oldest. Yeah, my son knows it. Yeah, he knows a bit of it. Yeah, mm -hmm. mm, he knows a bit, but. We'll see if he come round to my way of thinking. I hope he does, you know what I mean? Fingers crossed, man. You just keep doing what you're doing. And yeah, that's it. Keep doing what I'm doing and plugging my story, you know what I mean? And hopefully he'll understand. He'll start understanding how hard it was for me, you know what I mean, when he was growing up. Yeah. When are you at peace? Um, Have you ever been at peace? I'm at peace with my son. When I'm next to my boys, I reckon I'll be at peace. Both of them next to me, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Hopefully. You, you think that'll happen? Yeah. yeah. It'll happen. Mm-hmm. It'll happen soon enough. How when was the it? time's right. Yeah. When are you at your happiest? Um, Can uh, you enjoy happiness with the medication you're on and the pain that you're in? Is there any, can you be in a normal state where it's natural as it can be where you're in the present moment or is everything mm, kind of fuzzy with? Yeah, I guess so, yeah. A lot of, lot of fuzziness, yeah. But I am present though, I do focus a lot, I do a lot of breathing techniques and stuff like that to try and bring me back to my senses, you know what I mean? <laughs> try and stay in touch with my senses a lot, you know? How's your sleeping? It's fucking mad, mad, up at four <laughs> bells and stuff. I'm not good. <laughs> but I'm laughing at me because my sleep's shit. Yeah, mine is. I, I'm up, my missus will go off her head, but I'll, I'll, I'll go to sleep at 10, but yeah. then I'll be up at half 11. Yeah. And that's me to four. Yeah, yeah. And then I'll go up, I'll get up at seven. It's all kind of broken up. Yeah, mine is. So sometimes I'll get a great sleep. Mine's broken I'll get up. a great sleep sometimes mm. and I'll wake up fucking tired. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's me, yeah. Yeah, mm. I'll sleep, the more I sleep, the tired I get, yeah. Mm. How's the relationship with your missus now? Good, good, very I know good. she's got her own struggles, is that correct? Yeah, we both struggle, yeah. Yeah, it is, it's hard, but it's good. We're working on the baby, do you know what I mean? We focus on our baby. We had a struggle keeping him. Social services jumped down our throats, mate. Oh. We had to cut big chunks of air off us and all that. You know, they thought I was a drug addict. They thought she was crazy, you know what I mean? So they worked on us 
made us, they thought she was taking drugs and then she had to prove that she wasn't. I had to prove I wasn't taking drugs, you know what I mean? They done one big air follicle sample test on us. That That's was, a good thing as well, brilliant. to show that they are, because you imagine being in Brilliant, it was making addict. us jump through hoops to keep yeah. that baby, mate, you know what I mean? I was proud that we was going to keep that baby, the amount of things we did to keep that mm-hmm. baby. Worked hard to keep that baby honest. Did he still keep tabs on you every month for every nah, week? Nah, nah, nah. He signed us off within weeks. He, he was, he was through a, right the way through a pregnancy. Excuse me. Right the way through a pregnancy. And then as soon as the baby was born, you see how she was, they went, right, we want to get you off it straight away. She was off it in weeks, which mm. was great, amazing, you know what I mean? Four or five months, she was done, signed off. Mm-hmm. The baby was four or five months old, which was excellent, innit? it? Yeah. Because, like I say, as much as the child services, they can be cunts, but also another hand. No, I think they're good, they are, Yeah, they're looking after babies and making are, sure yeah. that everything's run yeah. well because That's it. people be giving birth because the human trafficking stuff now, people selling kids. And I know, it's worse, kids, isn't it? It's, it's heavy stuff. Heavy it's a stuff big business. Now. It's very easy on the internet yeah, as well. Yeah, it's a big it? business and fair play. And that, that's how the UK, we, we have got strict laws. Mm. Obviously, listen, laws are there to be broken mm. in some ways, mm. but when it comes to protecting children... Yeah, I love it. There needs to be as strict as it can be. Got to be, and yeah. it's got to be because the, the prison system's fucking terrible for sentences for sex cases. Yeah, of course it is. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? You're, like, not, you're not getting punishment in prison, are you? Yeah. It's too easy, isn't it? Prison, mm-hmm. like it, you're only using your freedom. That's the only thing you've lost. Nothing else, I feel. How was it doing your lad Bible interview? It was quite good. Yeah, it was quite um, hard to do. Hard. All of them are hard to do. You know what I mean? They're all hard to do, but. I push myself to do them. Then butterflies is what I search for, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I think that's my drug now is them little butterflies. But mm-hmm. yeah, um, a lot of a lot of the future is brighter than it would have been. I'm glad I'm glad to be alive. I thank my lucky stars I'm alive every day. Mm-hmm. But I just don't know what reason I'm here for yet. Yeah. But again, your book, how, how was it writing your book? Born in prison, make sure you listen. I'm going to leave a link in the description, so make sure you support Marvin. Yeah. He's trying to do the right thing, support his family. How was yeah. it writing your book? So, Born Very, in prison, how I yeah. survived, shooting, stabbings, prison, crack addiction, Manchester gangs and dog attacks. What, yeah, what dog attack you, bro? Oh, my God, mate. I got, I got, um, I was fucking robbing drug dealers and robbing, <laughs> robbing punters again and got the gang members Took me round, went round to a gang member's uh, gang leader's fucking avenue where I got took in a car one day because um, I'd been robbing all the shots on the estate and I got took and he put an English bull on me and it chewed me to foot. But that's not even the worst one. The worst one was the police. I was smoking crack in an empty building in the city centre one day. The police have come and I've panicked. Didn't want, you know, thought, shit, I'm next. So I've tried to hide and he put this big fucking house station on me. And it come and grabbed me from my leg here, from my thigh, and it pulled me out by my, my thigh, took half my leg with it, you know what I mean? Big scars on my legs where this big police dog ripped me to shreds. How many times you been stabbed? A couple, yeah. I got stabbed in my leg and I got stabbed here of my mate over the bleeding um, can of beer. Just because I wouldn't kind of buy him a can of beer, he stuck a big knife in my side. Big massive hole in my side there. But um, luckily it didn't touch no, uh, anything, you know, the mains and that. Any any or body organs, so I discharged. Well, I didn't even just die. I signed in, went to the main reception. Went, is this gonna kill me, love? We sort of a nurse, and she had a look at him. Went, no, it's not serious. I don't feel sweet. That's a do for me. I'm gone. It was fucked off. Mm-hmm. Went back smoking crack. Mm-hmm. Everything that you've been through, and try to find answers, try to find your family. How was it when you, the kind of family thing kind of get put to bed and you try to become clean, you try to become a dad? Mm, it's been hard, you know. It's been hard trying to um, just get everything right, really. Just juggle everything. I'm not used to it, you know what I mean? I don't know how to build relationships. I don't know how to keep relationships. I'm not used to all that, do you know what I mean? I'm just going with the flow, yeah. I've got a few lovely cousins who message me and, you know, everything's nice. Yeah, because it's sad to, you've never been shown love. Yeah, from the day you were born I mean, yeah. who's the first person to show you love my missus probably was that when you felt even because yeah. if I was in relationships if people gave me love I'd end them yeah I think I was not worthy of it or I mm. think they're going to leave anyway yeah. so I'd rather deal with the pain now than yeah 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 well it, I've been in I've, that, she's only my second ever serious relationship anyway you know what I mean like uh, my first one I got a baby out of it so 
then I got addicted to drugs, so I didn't really have relationships, you know what I mean, for many, many years, and then just daft little. So then when I got met Kira, that was my second serious relationship. So I've had two relationships and two kids out of both of them, you know what I mean? So I don't really, not really knowledgeable in relationships as much, you know what I mean? How do you Life keep, skills. How do you, how have you kept in this relationship so long? <clears throat> um, just being loyal and loving, I think, and just, you know, looking after each other, you know what I mean? Because we've always looked after each other. I mean, she's been through some dreadful stuff, things in her life, you know? Why she never left you? Um, I think because I'm such a nice person. <laughs> yeah. that's what she said why she hasn't <laughs> because being on it and the fuck ups in the prisons it's an easy out for people yeah I know this relationship ain't going anywhere yeah I know I'm out yeah do you feel blessed to have somebody that's yeah, the only person lucky. that's probably never left you yeah I'm very lucky yeah mm -hmm. yeah of course very very lucky um, she's been through her own struggles as well but yeah it's good yeah she's the only person who's never left me so far yeah how is it talking about your life i know it'd be tiring and it's hard it's not training. easy it's not easy but um it's therapeutic for me i feel like a benefit off it do you know what i mean i feel mm -hmm. like i empower myself every time i do it do you know what i mean and getting my story out there and people reading my story is really really good to know you know what i mean how was it writing about were you nervous it was hard as hell yeah it was very hard lots of many many hours nights and nights and nights you know what mm -hmm. i mean so i had a really good vi editor called victoria um, I used to send tons of information to, you know what I mean? And then she'd chop a bit off it and tell me what was important and what not, you know, and then she'd send it me back and then we'd work together, you know what I mean? So I've got to hand it to Victoria, my wonderful editor, for helping me get to where I am now. So. Yeah, fair play, man. Congratulations. Thank you. Where do you go forward for the future, man? What's the plans? Um, do you have big visions? I have, yeah. I want to be telling the world my story and helping others and hopefully set up a charity you know what i mean to help abuse kids and stuff like that something what about, like that what about speaking in schools and prisons? all of that yeah speaking yeah but what i want to have people um other survivors speaking because i've done my speaking now i'd rather have a group of others who were willing to talk you know what i mean yeah what's the biggest thing for someone to speak out what do you mean? What well, is, what's the biggest thing that, that because like you say, it took you nearly twenty years. Yeah, you've got to. I think. I think what I, I'd urge people, victims, to go and report it now. Don't wait another minute. And if and that secret shouldn't be shouldn't be chewing you up. It should be chewing the abuser. Should be feeling it, not you. So you're being burnt off that secret. You know what I mean? You're letting it burn you from the inside out. Don't. Go and report it now and see what happens. And see how free you get off it. Mm -hmm. See how free you really releases you off it. You'll see, you'll feel it. You'll feel released off it. You know what I mean? It'll set you free. How can people contact you if they want to, looking for someone to speak to? It's been moving I'm always available, Instagram, Facebook. I'm there, mate. I'm there, yeah. Anyone can message me anytime they want. I'll always give them a minute if I can. For anybody that's in this struggle now or battling with addiction, what advice would you have for them? You can get out of it straight away tell yourself don't be waiting for someone to tell you you don't need anyone to tell you you can tell yourself that you can change and you can get clean and your life will change you'll see it happen if you tell yourself it's, you're gonna do it you'll do it and for anybody that's what to buy your book where can they buy it um it's available on amazon james um 10.99 9.99 available on amazon or 4.99 on amazon kindle as well Marv, listen, mate, I don't want to hold you back because I know you, you'll be tired, mate, but... Thank you. For, would you like to finish up on anything? No, no, that's fine. You're ready to roll, mate, yeah. Listen, brother, for coming on today and telling your story. Thank you. Very dark, but I'm proud of you for trying to make the changes, trying to become a better person, trying to become a father. It's not easy, but you're doing it. And like I say, anything I can ever do in the future, just drop me a message Thank and I'll you, help Jay. out as much as I can, Respect mate. Listen, all the best for the future, Thank mate. Thank you very, Take very care. much, mate. God bless you. Thank you, James. Cheers, Marv. Cheers, buddy. Thanks.